political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. You know, I, I now have different thinking on that. You know, uh, that 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 there's a, a certain uh, brittleness to political power, uh, to, to military power. You know, like the fall of the Soviet Union taught me a lot, because that was a military bureaucratic dictatorship, and yet, bam, when it was time for it to go, it went. Mm -hmm. You know, but the way people think and the way people feel is different than who's in power at the time. I mean, the yeah. people that are the really the community, not the, not necessarily the government. So it's like I can see the arms and the government. You know, you're going to take over a, a place, but to get to have like a real change, you ha it has to come from within people and the change of heart, change of mind <coughs> to be truly influential. <coughs> so, what do you think you're accomplished? What, what, I mean, do you think that you? What, what, well, I just wanted to comment on that. Okay. I, I think there's two. Forms of power. I'm not making. I, I read. Yeah, this. No, no, no. I think. That, I, think I, I read this. Uh, I didn't make it up, but I, but it's very important to my thinking now, which is that um, that the basic real power is consensual power. Mm -hmm. It's the power of people to either consent or not consent to the government, versus coercive power. Right. The United States doesn't need coercive power the government to maintain control in this country because it's got consensual power, right? All the coercive of power in the world didn't help the Shah of Iran when the people decided to withdraw their consensus, right? Same way with the, the former Soviet Union. The Communist Party was a military bureaucratic dictatorship, right? But when the people withdrew their consensus, finally, after 70 years, it fell. And it, there's many examples of it. Um, the, the, the whole system in the South was maintained through terror, you know, the segregation system. Violent terror, constantly. But when enough people withdrew their consensus, it fell, you know. So uh, my thinking is that, non, that, 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 that military power is, that, that Chairman Mao was wrong. Military, uh, political power does not grow out of the barrel of a gun and that it grows out of the consensus of, of the people. That's what it's for. And that, that, that nonviolence is, is, a practice, is a democratic practice, whereas guns is not a democratic practice. I turned myself in in 1970, uh, uh, 1977. Most of the people in the Weather Underground turned themselves in. Some didn't. Uh, and some of them were old friends of mine, including the guy who first recruited me into SDS way back in 65. It, it, he's a character in the book, David Gilbert. Yeah, he comes across well. You mentioned him a lot. Yeah, uh, he's, he's a really nice guy. He's in prison for the rest of his life. So um, they hooked up with a remnant of the Black Panther Party, which called itself the Black Liberation Army. And their, their main uh, revolutionary work was, was, was robbing armored cars. For what purpose? Hey, well, that's a good question. How about money? <laughs> well, but that's qu I, obviously, but the question was, what do you do with the money? Mm. See, I knew how much it cost. They were making like a million bucks here and 1.3 million there, <laughs> 2 million. I knew how much it cost. To, to run an underground, and it wasn't in that, it wasn't, you know, millions. And, and there's a lot of theory. Maybe and, they were investing in, investing in films or no, something? No, they were, <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, that's were, what I'd do. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what it was, but okay. there's a lot of evidence that they were running a drug operation in Harlem, and that this was financed it. Anyway, these friends of mine got involved, and they, and in the course of a, of a robbery, two cops and a Brinks guard were murdered, and my friends were the getaway drivers. The upshot of it all was some people were killed, and I mean, some of, some of the black people were killed, and some of the white people, and there were trials, and they got, a bunch of people went to prison for the rest of their lives, and one of them was my Three of them, in fact, were close friends of mine, intimates. Years, a year after Sue and I separated, in October 1981, I got a call from my father. He was hysterical. He had just heard on the radio that Kathy Boudin, my old friend and weather comrade, had been busted in an attempted armored car robbery in Rockland County, upstate New York. A Brinks guard and two cops were killed. The blood of those policemen is on your hands! 
He screamed at me, The blood of those policemen is on your hands! He screamed at me across 2,000 miles. What are you talking about? I asked. It's your stupid ideas that started all this, and it's my fault I let you get away with it. It's not likely you could have stopped me, I said, more or less rationally, but I was trembling in the side. Look, you're not responsible for anything. Maybe I am. I don't know. Let me get to this paper. Arrested along with Kathy was another friend, Judy Clark, from the f former University of Chicago SDS chapter, who had also been a founder of Weatherman. The front page of the New York Times ran a picture of a dazed Kathy, gaunt and with long, curly, dark hair, being led into a police station. Beneath was a smaller, fuzzier shot of Judy Clark, and there was a third picture of an unidentified suspect, a male with a prominent, bashed-in nose and a very dark, full beard and thick head of hair. Both Judy and the man had black eyes and looked as if they'd been, ba they'd been badly battered. I stared at the man, trying to recognize him. Slowly it dawned on me that this was David Gilbert, my old mentor from Columbia. In the many years since the Brinks robbery, I've kept repeating the question over and over in my mind. What's the difference between David and Kathy and Judy and myself? Rashly, I knew that I had gotten out of the underground in 1977 and that I had left the ideological cult of armed struggle even earlier. Yet, more deeply, I felt that there was no difference. I loved these people. They were my intimates. And what we'd started together, they had merely continued straight to the tragic end. My father was right. I did bear some responsibility. You say the book is dedicated to your parents. Their unconditional love kept me going. In this book, I hope to answer my mother's eternal question, how could you do this to me? <laughs> <laughs> Can I read you something? This is going to yeah. be the only people I've ever shown this to. I'm going to put this in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. And this is called The Book of Redemption. As I write this, <coughs> my mother, age 97, and in hospice <coughs> care, is putting her dying on hold in order to live to see my book. Maybe that's why I've strung out the writing so long. Recently, Bertha hasn't been able to focus on images or thoughts too well, but she does have occasional moments of lucidity. She always remembers the book. She's in Whippany, New Jersey, and I'm in Albuquerque, but we talk to each other daily in a manner of speaking. Both my parents called their mothers every day of their lives. In 2004, when Bertha was as sharp as ever, I did a screening of the Academy Award-nominated documentary, The Weather Underground, at her local Jewish community center in West Orange, New Jersey. The room was packed with about 400 friends and neighbors from my... Now he's editing as he's reading <laughs> <laughs> From my parents' six decades in the community. The median, the median age was at least 75. This was a homecoming of sorts, because in the movie, I'm featured as a 20-year-old revolutionary and also as a 50-year-old grown-up reflecting on the kid. After the film, I started a Q&A with the, with the audience. My mother, in the second row, immediately began waving her hand, unable to control herself. I have a question.